Don't do defense work. You'll hate it. Hey, personal injury work. You make good money doing that. Yeah, more fun. Plaintiff side is more fun. You gotta learn how the big boys defend first, anyway. So. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. They just bill hours. They is just crank it. Yeah. I, I may end up doing labor and employment. I don't even know. Yeah. We'll yeah. See. Look, nice yeah. Nice to meet you too, Miguel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. My name is Ryan Bates. I'm the chair of an unofficial committee that's been working to organize the speaker series we're kicking off here today. Before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to take your permission to say a few brief words about the series itself. I approached Professor Schrader last spring with the idea of bringing to campus a bipartisan series of people lawyers, politicians, and others who could talk to us about their personal experiences in politics and how they incorporate a passion for politics into a lifetime of practicing law. I wanted to find people who could demystify the political process and provide guidance to Duke students <coughs> on becoming directly involved in state and national politics. Professor Schrader apparently liked the idea, and I'd like to offer my thanks to him and to the program in public law for their generous support of our speaker series this year. We plan on bringing to Duke Law a number of lawyers who practice political law in one form or another, and also politicians and public servants. They'll discuss the importance to a legal career of political public service and the importance to the health of our political system of having smart and passionate lawyers willing to serve the public. In fact, we will have a former chair of the Democratic National Committee, Joe Andrew, here to discuss electronic voting reforms and voting rights on October the 18th. I hope you'll all be able to join us. However, we wanted to start our series with a topic that was a little bit um, sexier, I guess. <laughs> Why someone would choose to run for office and how each of us can make a similar commitment to public service in our own lives. Our ideal candidate to talk about this topic was someone who had run for high office as a political newcomer rather than as a career politician. Someone who decided in the classic phrase that he was mad as hell and just wouldn't take it anymore. Our speaker today fits precisely this profile. <laughs> Paul Hackett, for those of you who may not know his background, volunteered to rejoin the Marine Corps and to deploy to Iraq in 2004. He returned to Ohio after service in Ramadi and Fallujah, just as President Bush appointed the incumbent representative in his district to serve in the Bush administration. Mr. Hackett jumped into the special election race, winning the Democratic nomination to face Gene Schmidt in a district that went 64% for Bush in 2004 and has the highest per capita Republican donation rate in the country. Why? Because, he said, and I quote, with all that this country has given me, I felt it wasn't right for me to be enjoying life in the Cleveland suburbs when Marines were fighting and dying in Iraq. During his campaign, Mr. Hackett gained the national spotlight for his criticism of the war in Iraq and his labeling of President Bush as a chicken hawk. Despite what seemed overwhelming odds against him, Mr. Hackett lost the congressional race by less than four points. However, in doing so, he inspired and energized a dispirited and disillusioned Democratic Party. I'm certain that he will continue to do so, and in fact, he declared only two days ago that he would run in 2006 for the Ohio Senate seat currently held by Republican Mike DeWine. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll join me in giving a very warm welcome to our speaker, Iraq War veteran and Democratic Senate candidate, Paul Hackett. Thank you. Can everybody hear me through this? Okay. Well, I didn't apply to Duke Law School because I, I, I knew with my uh, shenanigans and antics in undergraduate school that there's no way I was, <laughs> I was getting accepted to Duke Law. And I think it also had something to do with the fact that I had applied to Duke in undergraduate school and uh, didn't get accepted. So it's, it's nice uh, that finally I get a chance to come down and, uh, and see the university. Although you, you've got to do something about the wireless internet here because uh, it just it doesn't want to allow Apple computers to, uh, to communicate with them. Um, thanks so much uh, for inviting me. The, the pictures, I hope you don't mind. If you, if you get tired of looking at the pictures or get distracted, let me know and I'll turn it off. Um, I throw this up there sort of, as, sort of a segue into talking about getting into politics. I had never held high office. I had uh, been involved in city council politics in a little small town of 7,000 that I lived in. Uh, at the time uh, for about three years, but otherwise had never, uh, never really wanted to be involved in politics so much. Uh, it was never really an ambition, but uh, I enjoy sort of telling the story how I got involved in this congressional race and what sort of kept me involved 
in politics post the uh, election uh, loss. I was sitting in Kuwait in the middle of March of this year, uh, just having completed a uh, seven-month tour with uh, the Fourth Civil Affairs Group that was there in direct support of First Marine Division, which is headquartered in Ramadi, uh, Iraq, and I was also in Fallujah. And um, we were getting ready to, uh, to come home to the States, and uh, we were waiting on an air flight uh, back. And uh, they park us down in, in Kuwait, which is just a god-awfully hot place. And uh, they've got these huge tent cities. And um, one of the tents and one of the complexes actually has a USO. It's got uh, a place where you can work out in the morning. It's, it's got uh, everything that you would sort of imagine on a standard military base, but it's just out in the middle of a desert, and it's hot and it's flat, and it's incredibly bright. And uh, we had nothing to do. And I'd get up in the morning, I'd work out, and then I'd go to the USO, which had all these big screen TVs and lounge chairs, and there's a movie theater in there. And uh, I hadn't seen really US news on TV for, for months. And uh, I remember vividly, really, the first day I'm in there, and it, it, it must have been like 60 degrees. They had the air conditioning so low, which was just great. And uh, they, they, would, they would literally pass out blankets so we could lay in these lounge chairs and, and wrap up in the blankets and stay comfortable. And I'm watching CNN, and there on CNN is the coverage of the Congress shut down, in my description, uh, shut down to deal with Terry Schiavo and the Terry Schiavo issue. And for me and, and all my other buddies uh, who, who were coming back with me, uh, Republican, Democrats alike, we were sitting there scratching our heads going, what, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, We just got done fighting in Iraq, and we come back, and the number one issue that Congress is dealing with is, at least how I see it, intervening into the private lives of a private family in the United States. That seemed a little bit extreme to me, and we'd all sit around and talk about that for the couple of days we were hanging around in, in Kuwait. Well, flash forward a couple of days, um, and uh, I'm getting off the plane in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, I go walking down the, the aisleway, and uh, I look, look down, and I'm doing this, and uh, I see my wife, and I see the kids, and I see, uh, to, to my surprise, a bunch of friends who my wife had invited uh, to come welcome me home. And uh, one of my buddies, who's also an attorney in Cincinnati, uh, does class action work, SEC class action work, he met me at the airport and told me that the day before that our congressman, Rob Portman, had announced that he was going to be stepping down because he had just been nominated to be George Bush's uh, trade secretary. And he suggested to me that, in his words, he said, hey, you ought to think about running for that congressional office. And you got to keep in mind, I hadn't seen my wife and kids in like seven months. And he literally sort of pries himself into the mix of my embrace with my wife and my kids, you know. <laughs> I'm crying, the kids are crying. They don't know why they're crying, but they're crying. You know, my wife is crying, and it's this big, happy family. And I literally looked at Mike, and I said, Mike, you got to be out of your frickin' mind, you know. I mean, what are you talking about? And he's like, no, no, you got to do this. And, and uh, my, Mike and I are sort of kindred political uh, spirits to, to the extent that maybe like many of you, we, we would frequently sit around and just carp, complain, criticize the state of politics on, on both sides of the fence in the United States. And I guess really, to explain how I got involved in that congressional race, that was it. I mean, I had this sort of foundation of watching this Terry Schiavo fiasco, uh, having just come out of Iraq, and then been presented with this opportunity to essentially put up or shut up and try to make a difference. And I mentioned to my wife, who was, who was there when Mike suggested this, uh, but before we left the airport, I, I said to her, I said, hey, what do you think about that? And uh, you know, my wife and I, we've known each other you know, over 23 years now, and I'm only 43, so we've known each other a long time, since we were kids, basically. And, uh, you know, she was so damn happy to have me home in one piece that at that point I could have said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about running for dog catcher. What do you think about that? And she would have said, hey, sounds like a great idea. 
So she basically, she said, yeah, you know, that sounds, that sounds like a great idea. And I, and I now describe it as, to, to uh, quote uh, Ryan, uh, it, it is sort of right at that point, and, and even to some extent now, I'm, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, is, is how I usually tell people what really motivated me to get in into uh, the congressional race. And, and I guess some explanation is, is warranted on the, the mad as hell because now everybody, Republicans get upset when they describe Democrats as just being angry and Democrats are apologetic about just being angry. So there's all this stuff about it. And I say, hey, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I am mad because we live in the greatest country in the world. And I, I truly believe that. I mean, we, we've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, we've got some flaws, but yeah, that's life. Um, but we've got this great country that to the rest of the world really represents freedom, democracy, greatness, affluence, all these things that we take for granted. That's what we represent to the rest of the world. And the strange part about that is there's so many pockets in the rest of the world that really despise us. And what's even stranger about it is that these pockets that despise us really want to be like us in some ways, or they want to come here, they want to learn about us. So I'm not really sure why that is, but I think about this great country and I think about the path that I see this country heading down these days. And I mix that with Terry Schiavo and I mix that with coming back from Iraq and I mix that with an open congressional seat. And uh, you, you jiggle it around a little bit in the bottle, shake it up and I decide I'm going to run for this congressional race. Bottom line, I felt I could perhaps contribute a voice to knocking the United States back onto the right track. I say, let, let me just do a quick survey here. How many are self-described Democrats or progressives? Come on. All right. How many are self-described conservatives, Republicans? OK. I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. The numbers are kind of reversed. <laughs> Most of the hands that go up are self-described conservatives and Republicans. And I would typically, out on the stump, I would ask the same question. And I would say, especially when I was in the district, I'd walk around, shake everybody's hand who was a self-described Republican, say, I, I need your vote. And I want you to know that I'm going to represent you, too. Stop and think about it. I think your party has been hijacked. I don't know if you have those private thoughts or if you discuss that among, yourself, uh, among yourselves, but I grew up in arguably the most conservative part of the state of Ohio, and most of my professional acquaintances and friends are Republicans, and we talk about this. And I think that the Republican Party has essentially been hijacked by re religious fanatics. It's, in my opinion, no longer the party of fiscal responsibility. It's no longer the party of limited government. Uh, it's no longer the party of a strong national defense or fair trade. It's abandoned these principles that I grew up hearing about in a Republican part of the world. Uh, I'm fond of saying that Barry Goldwater is spinning in his grave today when he looks at the Republican Party. Think about limited government. I mean, it used to be, you know, Barry, Barry Goldwater was in a libertarian way pro-choice because he used to say, yeah, it's none of the government's business what people do in their private lives and we shouldn't be in the business of dictating what people do in their private lives. And uh, to that extent at least, I, I usually offer my hand to the Republicans in the crowd or certainly when I'm in the state or in the district, I suggest to them that they take a long hard look at their party and in the direction that their party is going in and let's face it, the direction that their party is leading the United States in. And I think that we need to make uh, a change um, in that. The Democratic Party needs to make a change. And the Democratic Party, in my opinion, has, has gotten sidetracked on a lot of social issues, uh, has not demonstrated much leadership in the last, certainly, five years, um, even though they're in the minority. Uh, they still have a responsibility to demonstrate some sort of leadership, come up with an idea, do more than simply criticize. So to the extent that the Republicans criticize the Democrats for just simply criticizing and not having a uh, a solution to the problem. I tend to agree, uh, tend to agree with the Republicans uh, in that department, and, uh, and feel free to. I've always felt free to criticize both parties, and I think that 
folks like you who are out here, who are well-educated, who for the most part probably come from very good backgrounds, need to at one point in your lives consider uh, public service. And I never really had anything to do with public service. I'm 43 years old now until I was 42 years old. And I think that democracy works best when everybody is involved and everybody takes the time to frankly sacrifice some of their time, some of their income potential, and uh, get involved. Because right now, my opinion on both the Democratic side and the Republican side is essentially the people who get involved are the, the people who, from age 10 years old, say, you know, I want to grow up and be a congressman, or I want to grow up and be a senator, or I want to grow up and be a president. And they graduate from college, they graduate from law school, and they embark on this track of becoming a professional politician. And uh, I don't really think that serves the United States well. And um, I think that uh, probably it's best for people to go out and get some experience in life, get some education, get kicked in the teeth, you know, spend some time on unemployment maybe, search for a job, have some hardship, and it gives you a better perspective on life. But in any event, you, you're going to get those life's, life's experiences sometime after you graduate from college or law school, or the, although many of you guys and gals I know uh, have come back to law school after having a, a, a career and whatnot. And uh, I think that's important. Uh, so anyways, jumped into a congressional race with absolutely no professional political experience. And uh, my first stop, one of these pictures somewhere, there's a, there's a picture of myself and Donald Rumsfeld. I love that picture. Have, have you seen that one flash up yet? Well, the guy on the other side of Donald Rumsfeld uh, is a good friend of mine. That picture was taken in uh, Baghdad. And uh, Bill Reynolds, the other uh, uniformed uh, officer in that uh, picture, is Arlen Specter's chief of communications. And Bill and I were in Ramadi and then Fallujah together. And... Um, I asked Bill, I said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about running for this congressional race. Where the hell do I start on this? And he said, oh, you've got to go up to the DCCC in Washington, D.C. Well, we were actually in Anacostia at the time, so the DTRIP was right up the street. And for those of you who don't know what the DCCC is, which I didn't know at the time, it's Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. And these are sort of the power brokers, subdivision of the Democratic National Committee, uh, that oversee congressional races for Democrats. And I called up, uh, Bill had given me the name of, uh, that's in downtown Fallujah. Uh, Bill had given me the name of the uh, gentleman at the uh, DCCC who heads up um, essentially congressional recruiting for congressional races. And I went up and I met this gentleman and I sat down with him and uh, I said, I'm interested in running in the open seat in the 2nd Congressional District in Southern Ohio. And he said, oh, well, we've had a lot of people contact us and express an interest in running in that. Uh, well, why do you think that uh, you can win, or why do you think that uh, you, know, you can even be viable in this district that is, uh, in the last two elections, voted 75% for Bush and 75% for Rob Portman, uh, the congressman just stepping down? And I said, well, I grew up in this district. I think I know this district pretty well. My father, who was a traveling salesman, took me all through all the roads growing up, all through Portsmouth and all through Southern Ohio. And I spent my entire life driving around there, hunting uh, in those counties. And uh, that's where I'm from. I think I know this district pretty well. And, uh, and I went on to tell him, I said, I, I said you know, and I, and I kind of got a feeling the fact that I just got back from Iraq, I actually said, I, I think the fact that I'm an OIF2 vet might make a difference because there are a lot of young men and women who are OIF vets and, and fighting in OIF. And he kind of looked at me and he said, what's, what's OIF? <laughs> and I said, I, I'm, forgive me, I'm a little bit profane, and I, I said, I said, I probably said something profane, but I said, hey man, I said, OIF, that's Operation Iraqi Freedom, and I said, by the way, that's the problem, or part of the, one of the problems with the Democratic Party is you knuckleheads don't get the military, and here you are in Washington, D.C., part of the process that makes these decisions and you don't even know what the hell OIF is. I mean, nobody in the military calls 
it the war in Iraq. We call it OIF. So when I talk to Miguel over here, I say, hey, man, you know, were, were you in OIF 1 or were you in 1 Tech 2 or were you in OIF 2 or, or what? And, you know, he says, you were in OIF 1, right? And, uh, and that's it. I mean, nobody says, oh, I was in the Iraq war and I was stationed in Ramadi. I mean, it's, it's a lack of understanding of the language of the military. The Republicans are far better at speaking military than the Democrats are. And uh, I'm fond of telling all the Republican leadership or the Democratic leadership that I meet that they got to get with the program on that because they're losing voters in the military that otherwise, if they were, if they were voting in their economic and, and really their lives' interests, they would, I think, be voting uh, Democratic um, for economic reasons and other reasons. And uh, the, Dems, the Dems don't really get that. So anyways, I explain this to him, and he kind of pats me on the back. He says, good boy, be on your way now. And uh, by the way, if you can raise $100,000, we'll take a look at your race, and maybe we'll come in and help. Well, the, the entire race was a 15-week race from the beginning of the primary to Election Day, and the, the primary was smack dab in the middle. And by, pri by the primary, we had raised $50,000, which is just tremendously painful. It's a real pain in the ass, because you, you spend all day on the phone calling people who you don't know, and they don't know you, and you ask them for money. And when somebody first floated this to me, they said, hey, you know, have you ever raised money before? Do you know what it's like to call up on a telephone and ask somebody for money? And I said, yeah, actually, I do. I'm a personal injury attorney. I get on the phone and talk to adjusters all day long and ask them for money. So this, this shouldn't be that tough. Well, it, it is tough because when you're doing personal injury work, at least you've got a sheet of facts that you get to talk about how your client was rear-ended and sustained you know, $10,000 in property damage and they had $3,000 in medical bills and are gonna require future medicals of you know, $3,000 over the next two years. And by the way, the case is really worth $30,000. And then you, you got something to argue about. Well, when you're calling up asking for money as a politician, it kind of goes like this. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Hackett. I'm running for the second uh, congressional district in Southern Ohio. Where'd I get your name? Uh, well, you were on a donor list <laughs> that the DNC gave me. And, and just, well, okay, all right, thank you. you know, and then you spend seven hours doing that. And uh, it's, it, it gets a little bit, yeah, it's not painful, it's not hard. It just gets old after a while trying to connect with people and get them to send you some money. So by the primary, we had about $50,000, and that's not enough to even come close to getting up on TV. And really, our goal was to raise about $200,000 so we could send out some direct mail pieces and, and really focus on a grassroots campaign. And um, my campaign manager, who'd never managed a race in Ohio, he's about 28 years old, and. Anybody been involved in, in politics? I mean, like in a campaign, seriously, like a, okay. Nobody involved in campaign management is over the age of 29 years old. <laughs> Problem number one. Um, but anyways, uh, David, young man, comes from Missouri, had run a bunch of special races, and I kind of stumbled over him through a fundraiser who I'd met. She was 23. Uh, and I met her at a uh, Democratic function, and she brought in David. And uh, the goal was basically to get some direct mail pieces out. We had defined different universes, potential people who, who would be interested, perhaps, in what I had to say about the war, uh, my take on politics in the United States and in and, and Ohio, and, and maybe we could connect on that way. So we wanted to get enough money to get a couple of direct mail pieces out to these universes before Election Day. And we figured it was going to cost us $200,000 to do the direct mail. And um, David had been working and developing and just badgering different media outlets with the story of Paul Hackett. And one day we got a call from John King from CNN. And uh, I guess the storyline kind of clicked with him. And he expressed an interest to come out and follow us around. He was going to come out before the primary. Something happened. He didn't come out before the primary. And he came out, uh, short, I guess, a week or so after the primary and did about a four-minute piece on Iraq War veteran comes home to southern Ohio to run in the most Republican district in the state of Ohio and arguably in the United States. And 
that, that was it. That was the first domino. And then we got a call from James Carville and Rahm Emanuel, who is a congressman out of uh, Chicago and who runs the uh, DCCC. And uh, Carville said, hey, we all, you all know who James Carville is. He said, so, well, yeah, I, I, I've been watching your race out there, and it looks like you've got a fight on your hands, and I, mean, I want to come on out and help you. <laughs> like, Whoa. <laughs> James, you can come out, but we're not giving you coffee. And uh, so that just began the snowball, and then we plugged him in with a fundraiser. I had uh, met with a gentleman who's a Republican business leader in uh, Cincinnati who's kind of an independent guy but it's self-identified Republican and was uncomfortable with uh, my opponent Jean Schmidt because she is very open about representing a very, you know, I, I'm not sure about saying it, she's a, she's a religious nut. Um, if there are any religious nuts in the audience, I apologize, but she's a, she's a religious nut. And, um, and Jimmy uh, was pretty concerned about that and so he came to us and said, you know, I'd be interested in maybe sitting down, talking to you, getting a view on where you are on politics, business, and so forth, and maybe I can help you. Well, we sat down, we had coffee, we clicked, and the next thing you know, it's now Jimmy Gould and James Carville are going to do a fundraiser, and they're going to invite all their Republican business friends, and then, bam, we have one fundraiser, and we do $110,000 at a fundraiser. Go figure. And then the DNC saw the reports that came in, because you have to file these financial reports at that point. I think it was like every 48 hours, might have been every 72 hours. And they look at the list and, and they think, oh my God, we've never seen these people on the list. And they look at the Republicans, they're like, oh my God, these, these guys are normally, re, you know, donating to Republicans. So that all of a sudden stimulated some interest at the DNC. And I think somewhere in the mix, I called President Bush a chicken hawk, and that just, it was like the heavens opened up <laughs> in a good way. And, and it, you know, the, the, money, the money and the national interest poured in. And what is, what is interesting about that is, number one, I frankly didn't think it was that big of a deal to call the President of the United States a chicken hawk, but I found out pretty soon who thought it was and who thought it was neat. Um, and the national media just descended on us at that point. And with the national media and the blogs, the money just poured in. And we did over $600,000 in cash online in about a week and a half, which suddenly, and this is about two weeks out, or it started two weeks out, all of a sudden the money just started rolling in, which allowed us then to do a TV commercial, um, which was the first time a Democrat had done a TV commercial in that district in some, I was told 30 years, I don't know if that's true or not. So that in part made the race um, competitive. So that, that's sort of the, uh, an overview of the race. Let me give you some thoughts and, and open it up for question. Everybody gets really excited about the fact that we did 48% in a traditionally 75 to 25 district. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of things about those numbers that really aren't that impressive. First of all, it's a special election in the summertime. It's the only game in town. Second of all, there is this neat storyline about a Marine combat vet who comes back to run as a Democrat. So it's a little bit different. There's nothing else going on. The war is going on in Iraq. Why does this guy come back to run? Why does he come back and run as a Democrat? And by the way, why does he call the president a chicken hawk and worse? And that sort of created some excitement and some buzz. But really the interesting part about the numbers throughout the seven county district that I ran in that I believe concern Republicans, although they may not admit it, is the fact that the four counties that I won are arguably the four most conservative counties in the state. One of them is, without a doubt, the most conservative county in the state. It's dry. Um, they were just recently shot down by the U.S. Supreme Court for wanting to put the Ten Commandments in granite in front of their public school. It's very fundamental, religious, uh, conservative uh, county. And I won that county. 
And everybody from a distance who looks at the race, they get excited about the 48%. When I look at the race, I get excited about the actual counties that I won were counties that we were told we didn't have a chance of winning. And I kept on telling my campaign manager, those are the counties I'm going to win because those are the counties I grew up in. I know those people. I am one of those people. And they're going to vote for me because we speak the same language, which is really, good for better or for worse, good or bad, that's really what politics to some degree boils down to is when, when you talk to people, do you connect with them? Do you communicate with them in terms that they relate to in some sort of way? And um, I, I think I did. I think the numbers sort of prove it. And I'll give you, we were talking about this last night at dinner. I, I, Democrats get so excited about how do you frame these issues? How do you talk about these social issues? And we have to sit down and we have to have a, 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 a group meeting and decide about how you talk about gay issues or let's have a focus group on how we address abortion or the war in Iraq. And after the election, when I started going up to D.C. to sort of debrief with the D.C. crowd, they'd say, well, how did you, you know, how did you, who was in your focus group on how to talk about gay issues? And I'd say, uh, me. And uh, well, who did you who did you frame that with? And I said, well, I got this buddy Mike Brodigan who encouraged me to run, and Mike and I would talk about these issues. And I, well, that was just you know so interesting, you know how you did this or that. And it's just like, guys, you're over processing it. Okay, you need to spend some more time out of Washington D.C. and just talk to people. And at the risk of sounding like George Bush, my apologies to the Republicans. You know, just just say it the say it the way you mean it. Just explain it. So. Uh, interesting aside, one day my fundraiser says after the primary, um, you need to meet with the gay leaders in Cincinnati. I was like, all right, no problem. And she says, well, what, what is, what's your position on gay marriage? And I said, who cares? She said, well, you can't say that. And I said, hey, give me a break, man. It's 2005. Who, who cares? I mean, gay people, straight people, who cares people? She says, oh, no, 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 you can't say it that way. You have to tell them this. And I said, look, you know, here's the deal. I mean, anybody who's graduated from college, I'm assuming, doesn't really obsess over these issues. And really what gay marriage or gay rights comes down to is when you walk into a courthouse, do you have the same rights as your straight friends? And if you think that gay men and women shouldn't have the same rights as straight men and women, <laughs> that's un-American. You know, that's unpatriotic. And, you know, it's just kind of like this look. It's like, wow, how did we get from we don't care or I don't care to that's just un-American if you don't believe in gay rights. But I, I never thought it was that complicated. And, uh, and pretty regularly out on the campaign trail, I would get asked that question in some of the most conservative areas. They'd say, well, where are you on gay marriage? And depending upon who was there and how many people were around, it would range from one time I was at an ice cream social, guy yells out from the table, where are you? What do you, what do you? what do you feel about gay marriage? And I said, well, there's my wife and there are my three kids. What do you think? And I just left it at that. You know, I figured if the guy's an attorney and he wants to cross-examine me and pin me down on it, I guess then I'll get into it. With them. And one time that actually happened, I, I, I was shaking hands at a uh, transmission plant, a Ford transmission plant in one of the counties, and a gentleman comes up, big burly guy, and he says, oh, I want to talk to you about gay marriage. And I said, all right. And he said, where are you on gay marriage? And I said, you know, who the hell cares, man? I mean, do you really care if the neighbors are gay? He said, well, you know, that's an abomination against God. You know, that's a sin. And I said, whoa, hey, man, is your, your, your God-fearing Christian like I am, right? And he says, damn right I am. And I said, well, you know, God makes gay people, God makes straight people. Where, you know, go figure. And he goes, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I, and I, I said, well, well, what do you mean you don't think so? And he goes, oh, they decide to be gay. And I said, well, let, now let me ask you a question. Did you decide to be straight? He said, well, well, no. And I said, well, what the hell makes you think people would decide to be gay? And he kind of ponders. And he said, well, it's a sin. And I said, well, you know, look, I'm not going to talk you out of that. But <laughs> here's, here's the deal, brother. You're, you're a God-fearing Christian. I'm a God-fearing Christian. God makes straight people, right? God makes gay people. God's got a plan, right? I mean, I hear it all the time. God's got a plan. So now you're telling me you don't agree with God's plan. 
And, uh, you know, he, it kind of puzzled him there for a minute. And I say, you know, I'm not going to convince you either way. I, I can tell you're struggling with these issues. You're thinking a lot about gay issues. You know, you've got to work that out yourself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm here to talk if you need that. And, <laughs> and you know, and, and that was the only, I, I, I just, it works for me. I just think it's ridiculous that we as Democrats try to convince somebody through some sort of academic, rational explanation about some of these issues. Um, it's just, let's move on. Let's, let's talk about the economy. And that's something that we can all relate to and all have concerns about. Um, abortion, obviously, in my district is a huge issue, as it is across the states. And when I'd get asked about that, I'd say, hey, you know what? I don't elect politicians to go to Washington, D.C. to be my spiritual leader. I get that when I go to church on Sunday. I don't need them to come and dictate to my wife what decisions she makes with her doctor any more than I need Washington to come in, open up the gun safe, and say, you can't have this gun, you can have this gun. Stay the hell out of my house. Stay out of my personal life. And back to the gay issue and gay marriage, I don't know anybody who's gotten divorced because the neighbors are gay, but I know a hell of a lot of people who've gotten divorced because the economy is so bad. And... Uh, you know, I've been told that's sort of a libertarian approach to, to working it, but it seems consistent. Democrats, if, if you want government out of your life on abortion, you, you have to accept government out of your life on uh, gun rights. It's, that's a tough issue uh, to uh, urban and city Democrats, uh, but it's an issue or it's an explanation that seems to work well, at least in southern Ohio, with independent voters and more conservative voters who don't like to be uh, preached to about uh, abortion or gay rights. My, my take on it is out in the rural parts, at least in southern Ohio, and most of the guys don't really care, but they just don't like the idea that somebody's going to come out in a suit and tell them, you know, you have to accept homosexuality. And I think that's where the Democrats have missed on it, is that we're trying to convince people that you have to accept that as you, or you just have to simply accept it. And I sort of look at it from the approach of, I'm not going to get anybody to accept something that's beyond their scope of understanding. And I don't think we should try to. I think what we should do is look at it in terms of civil rights. You walk into a courthouse, you don't have to check a box that says you're gay or you're straight. You just walk in, you get the same fair treatment regardless of whoever you are or you know, however it is that God made you. And uh, I, I'm critical of uh, the Democratic Party for trying to overprocess some of these issues. So, what questions you got for me? I'm running for Senate, by the way. Uh, if if I didn't get enough abuse in the uh, congressional race after I lost in the congressional race, it's a testament to the United States. Only in the United States can you lose a congressional race and uh, have people get excited about you running for another race. I was really amazed. I said, guys, I lost. You know, why, why are you coming back? And uh, so I started getting a lot of phone calls immediately after the, uh, the loss uh, with you know, people saying, hey, you, you know, DeWine's vulnerable. You ought to run against DeWine. I said, you know, I don't really care if DeWine's vulnerable. I said, what I care about is wh where have the political leaders been in the state of Ohio while we've shipped 300 manufacturing jobs overseas. That's, that's what I care about. So I don't really care if it's DeWine or Voinovich or somebody with a D after their name. I mean, the fact of the matter is regular working Americans, in my opinion, have just been left behind. And you guys are all going to go out, and you're going to have great jobs, and you're going to make a lot of money. And I guess my invitation to you is to not forget about the rest of the United States that um, maybe doesn't have it so good as, as you do. And I, I think that folks like us with education and, and a good profession and uh, high salaries have an obligation uh, to give back to uh, the community, your community, and your society. And uh, I, I grew up in a traditional Irish Catholic family, and my dad literally had the John Kennedy plate hanging in the dining room. There's a picture of John Kennedy in the middle. And over it, it said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. 
and you know when my folks were pissed off at us they would you know drag us in you, you see that you know <laughs> do you see that that's that's what we expect you know and as you know and on and on and that, that was sort of the standard and it seems to me in the United States today that for those of us who've had it good and I've had it really good uh, think that somehow or another our financial success is some sort of um, confirmation that we're better than somebody else and I tend to think that for those of us and those of you who are going to go out and have tremendous financial success that that increases your responsibility to this country and the society and that it's not confirmation that you're better and therefore entitled to something extra and uh, to my brother-in-law who complains about taxes I say hey you know what Taxes are a part of life in America. We, we pay taxes and we live in a great country and we get great benefit uh, from living in this country and receive direct benefits from the taxes that we pay. And uh, it's the price of admission. And if you want to have a serious discussion about taxes, let's talk about how our, our tax dollars are spent as opposed to should we pay more, should we pay less. I mean, who here doesn't think that sometime in the next five years, our income taxes are going to get increased. Who here thinks that we're going to pay, continue to pay, $5 billion a month in Iraq and over 200, I mean, the estimate is $200 billion to, to rebuild uh, the South after Katrina. Well, if they're saying $200 billion, boys and girls, it's, it's going to be more than that. It's going to be $400 billion. Because if you think back before we invaded Iraq, they were saying, it was, it was going to be a net gain because we were going to be able to pay for the war from the oil that we drilled. So I always figure if they say, whatever they say, it's going to be twice as bad. So how then do we pay for all of those expenses? How do we do that? Yeah. Yeah. When should the U.S. get out of Iraq and why? Now, because it's done. And it's not going to get any better. And anybody who's been over there knows that. There's no plan, there's no strategy, uh, there's nothing to gain by staying any longer. Whether we leave today, tomorrow, next year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, it will again spiral into the chaos that it's in now. It's in a civil war now. Anybody who says, oh, it's trending towards a civil war, it's like, hey, uh, have you been there? You know, it's, it's there, brother. I mean, look at the news, Najaf, in August 2004, there's a picture somewhere in here of me clearing weapons in Najaf. That's Takatam where you fly in. But in Najaf, in August of 2004, the Marines went in and they cleared Najaf. And uh, that's where the, the Mahdi army, was, which is a Shia army, was set up and they were fighting. That's Fallujah. That's the bridge where they hung the, uh, the uh, Blackwater Security Detachment yeah, determination. And, uh, <laughs> I, I made this thing in about 20 minutes on my iPod, and when I was out on the campaign trail, I would walk up, I'd slap down my flat screen, I'd plug in my iPod, and this thing would go, and all the other candidates are sitting there handing out, you know, like paper flyers and everything, <laughs> and everybody would come around. That's, that's Lance Corporal uh, Frias. That, that chunk of metal was off of an 81 mortar that landed at his feet. He was in a uh, fighting position and it landed and exploded and it sent that piece of shrapnel, it ricocheted off the barrel of his 240 Golf, which is a machine gun. It bent the barrel on the machine gun and lodged over his head. And I said, brother, this is your day. That's your look. Good luck charm. <laughs> what, 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 was the, what was the question you got me off on? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, look, um, it's, it's done. It's over. The, stop and think. What, what objective successes have we had in Iraq? I mean, I throw it out there. I mean, it, it, can anybody name an objective success that we've had in Iraq? I mean, you guys are going to learn about objective and subjective qualifications when you start practicing law, particularly if any of you guys do personal injury work or insurance defense. I mean, that's, that's the big mantra. You know, it's like, what objective signs of injury did he have? He just was subjectively complaining of the pain in his neck. Well, what objective signs of success have we had in Iraq? Purple fingers. Purple fingers. Well, somewhere in there, there's pictures of purple fingers. Uh, yeah, 
I think if I were advising George Bush, that's exactly what I'd say. I'd say, you know, we gave him a vote, we gave him a constitution, we freed him from a brutal dictator, and we stood up their military. <clears throat> I don't believe any of that, and I don't believe that any of those were legitimate reasons to go into Iraq. So what? They had a brutal dictator. Who appointed us policemen of the world? Okay? You know, and, and then they, the Republican Party, they couch that in this kind of tough talk about, you know, well, you know, we're going to defend freedom, we're going to spread democracy. Well, first of all, time out. The American people didn't agree to invade a country to spread democracy. So, you know, we're shifting the reasons there. And, and number one, if, if that's the rationale that we're going to invade countries to spread democracy, where do we start? How do we prioritize? And is, is that really how we want to spend our money and our blood? I don't think so. I don't think the American people would, would buy off on that. But with that said, the success of the vote on January 31st, 2005 in Iraq, or actually January 30th, was the fact that it was just logistically carried out. The numbers of people who participated were deplorable. And it's, it, it was like 2% of the eligible by age voters voted. 2%. Now, you'll hear the text, oh, no, it was 75%. Well, that was 75% of the people who registered. The problem is nobody registered because if they went down and registered, they were going to end up laying in a pool of blood on a street in Ramadi. So there were very few people who even registered to vote. Fallujah actually had, that's, that's the gas station in Fallujah, um, Fallujah actually had a very high voting turnout because we had the city entirely secured at the end of January in 2005. So it was a very, very, very safe place, probably this, arguably the safest place outside of the green zone to be. So, you know, the purple fingers, you can spin that as a minor success, but I don't see that overall as something that's going to last, number one. And number two, it's certainly not a justification to go into another country. And it's just, just to be really blunt about it, you know, I could care less if they get the vote or not in Iraq. Why should I care? I mean, you want to talk tough guy talk? So what? Machiavelli was a tough guy. Machiavelli say, hey, screw you. It's your problem. You guys fix it. We don't have to spend our billions of dollars in our lives over in Iraq. If they're spun up about, um, you know, a brutal dictator, they can deal with it. But sending over, you know, the Marines to do that? I think that's ridiculous. And uh, why aren't we in North Korea then? Why aren't we in Pakistan? Why aren't we in Sudan? I mean, the list goes on. So eh, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a bogus reason. And it's not that tough. It's not that tough of a principle. The, the, the tough principle, in my opinion, is tell them it's their tough luck. If they want to get rid of their, their dictator, let them do it. Now, with that said, if their dictator spreads their hate and discontent on our shores, yeah, I'm all about it. Let's go get them. You know, I, was, I, I, I had no problem with going into Afghanistan. I had no problem going to Iraq. I mean, it, for me personally, you know, you, you know the routine, right? I mean, your brothers and sisters in the Marine Corps are going over there. You're going to go over there. Whether or not you think it's the brightest thing to do uh, is a different story. Somebody had a question back there. Yes, ma'am. Elected to the Senate, and let's say we are still in Iraq, or we still have four hundred billion dollars of aid to give to hurricane victims. Are you going to bring up the idea of sacrifice for the American people to, you know, do more to conserve, our, well, just to conserve? Yeah, I, I, I've talked extensively about that in the congressional campaign, and said, you know, George Bush has got to stand up and ask people to sacrifice, and he's not. He just what was it? Just a week or so ago, he began very. With, with, with great hesitation to say, you, you know, we, we, we've, we've got to maybe conserve. It's like, you think so? What was your first clue? Um, I, I think, you know, that, that but, but both parties, Democrats and Republicans, are afraid to ask Americans to sacrifice. My take on it, for whatever it's worth, is that Americans are willing to sacrifice, but they want the leadership and they want the guidance on how to sacrifice and where to sacrifice. I mean, if I just heard this morning the reports the Army is having tremendous, like down 25% from their recruiting goals. Look, I mean, if this is a problem, President Bush, stand up and tell the American people, not in cryptic terms, tell them, we need all Americans to consider serving in the uniformed services of the United States military. We need all Americans, regardless of financial wherewithal, regardless of the zip code you grew up in, to, to come out and serve. 
I mean, he loves to compare our generation, this generation, with the greatest generation of sacrifice. But there's no sacrifice. In the greatest generation, lots of guys gave up their job and their family and went and served in World War II. There's been no ask from this government to do that. That's what leadership's all about, am I right? Lead by example, right? <laughs> Seek responsibility and take responsibility for your decisions. That's leadership principle number seven in the Marine Corps manual. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, third, on that, in that same vein, um, I know I've, I've heard um, career military officers um, talk about how the new volunteer force is so much better than it used to be. We're very happy because we have motivated soldiers and they're well educated and so on and so forth. But um, motivated servicemen and women. Oh right, right. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you. Because we have motivated Marines too. <laughs> okay. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Well, they're always volunteers, though, aren't they? We're all, yeah, we're all volunteers. Yeah. Right. My, my, my point is, it's again, it's back to this discussion about you, Democrats using the language of military well. When you hear Democratic politicians, they will blanket refer to everybody in the armed services as soldiers. Uh -huh. and, and we Marines, you know, yeah. you know, at our level, we don't get that spun up about it, but you, you offend a lot of 20-year-old Marines. I see. Well, when I was in the Army, um, a lot of the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and attending language school with some of the Marines, they... Um, they always like to be called Marines, right? Uh, yeah, of course. Well, okay. So anyway, so you're, you're, okay, you're interested my in my is, thought on the draft. My point is, yeah, when is a Democratic politician, I actually have two questions. When is it, uh, somebody other than Charlie Rangel going to come forth and say that um, it would be good for the country, um, it would, might be worse for some of the um, military commanders and career um, people, but um, it would be good for the country. Um, if we reinstituted a draft and this time made it fair and, um, you know, without all the, the right. education ones and da da da. And um, secondly, I would ask you if you are elected to the Senate, do you promise to keep <laughs> speaking directly and without? Um, slipping into Senate tees. I mean, I remember, I remember when uh, John Kerry said um, quite directly, um, how can you ask someone to be the last man to die for a mistake? He was this brilliant young politician um, with a somewhat um, comparable background coming back from a war and uh, speaking out against it. He was in and the then Navy. Something happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. But he, um, yeah, okay. No, I mean, here's my thought on the draft. Uh, I'm, I'm torn by it. Uh, you know, it would be a real hardship on the military to have a draft. It just would. I mean, the, the, the chaos and hate and discontent <laughs> that we'd have to put up with, with all the young men and women who don't want to be there. But, uh, but I, if, you know, if, if I take off my, my military cover and, and think in terms of society, yeah, I think it'd be a great thing for society because suddenly everybody would be less, um, less engaged. They would be, they'd be more engaged. And uh, they would be a little bit more thoughtful. And there would be a little less of the, the cowboy talk uh, about, you know, we're going to go in and you're with us or you're against us and bring it on. And, um, wouldn't it, it, it might be harder, again, on some in the military, but wouldn't having um, greater uh, manpower resources to call upon make it easier on some of those in the um, yeah, maybe, military but you, you, now who are called upon to do this repeated yeah. duty because we don't have enough? Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to get to that point sooner or later. I mean, somebody's going to talk about it more than just Charlie Rangel. I, I, society obviously doesn't want it. And uh, you have to ask the question, if, if society doesn't want it, you know, how does the leadership make that decision to do it? And it's, it's, so, it's, it's, so it's unpopular in the military and it's unpopular in society. But I thought that leadership was supposed to um, yeah, I agree. Know, discern these good ideas and um, oh, I agree. Um, advocate for them. All right. In the back. Um, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. My pleasure. And the other, my, my question is, uh, the other side of the draft argument 
why hasn't the Democratic Party addressed homeless wars for a backdoor draft and stop loss policy and trying to keep people uh, uh. I don't know. I don't get that spun up about that. I think that's kind of a, a, a bogus discussion, the, the whole backdoor draft and the stop loss. Uh, yeah, it's bogus. You're just whining at that point. I mean, look, when you sign up, you know that's the routine. Am I right? I mean, you just, when you sign up, you know that's the routine. And it works, and that's the bargain that you made. And if you don't like it, you shouldn't sign on the dotted line. I, I, I think the Democratic Party is just making a lot of hay out of, out of that, the backdoor draft. I mean, you, you can get out when your tour is up and your time is done. So the problem is if your contract is up a month before you deploy and you've already been stop lost, you're probably going. And definitely if your contract is up while you're three months into a one-year tour in Iraq, you're going. You're staying. You're not getting shipped home. That's just... That's just part of the program. I mean, look, the military doesn't cater to individual needs. And if you think it should, or if you're in the military and you want it to cater to your individual needs, you're just, you're in the wrong profession. So. All right. Um, obviously, uh, your personal story had a lot of appeal in the Southwest to hire those voters. But do you think anything short of that will actually get Republicans to vote Democrat? I asked this time from Butler County. What, what county? Butler. Oh, okay. Wow, it's a big Republican stronghold. Like the only Democrats there in my family. <laughs> 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 do you think that you have a chance, or anybody else falling short of your personal story of coming back from the war, has a chance in that area? In that area, in the state, or in the second district, uh, or all of the above? Second district. Like Hamilton. Well, but Butler County is just out of the second district. Um, I, you know, my, my take on it is if, if you look at the voter registration numbers in Ohio, or at least in the second district, they're, they're broken down in thirds, about a third Democrat, about a third, actually in the second, that's the state, actually in the second district, they're 10%, they're 10% Democrat, 15% Republican, and the balance is independent. So uh, there's a huge number of independent voters in Ohio. This is just my theory. And that those independent voters vote probably a great deal on emotion and connection uh, and not necessarily vote. I don't think they necessarily vote in their best interest. This is my explanation of it because I have a difficult time understanding why uh, a laborer votes for a government that supports the export of their job overseas or doesn't support, uh, you know, minimum wage increases or doesn't support prevailing wage, uh, you know, in the rebuild of uh, the southern United States. You know, it's like, get, let me get this straight. We, get, we give a multi-billion dollar no-bid contract to Halliburton so they, they can make a lot of money, which is no problem. This is America. That's what it's all about. But the laborers don't get the benefit of prevailing wage. So, but these guys and gals will still vote for this administration against their economic interests. And I, I write that off to packaging and messaging and connection that, uh, you know, probably a lot of men, blue collar, working class Americans, they look at a guy like John Kerry and they look at a guy like George Bush and they think, I'd rather go to a football game with George Bush. <laughs> I, you know, I don't necessarily say that in a cynical way. I say that it is more of a criticism to the Democratic Party and how the Democratic Party cultivates and encourages candidates uh, or just individuals to get involved in the process. And uh, I don't think that would necessarily change until the economy gets so bad that everybody's paying close attention to it. I mean, Bill Clinton was able to bridge that, that gap. And you have to ask yourself why. So it can't be just issues. Because Bill Clinton was you know, pro-gay rights, pro-choice, you know, pro some very progressive social agendas. Yet a lot of uh, folks who voted for Bill Clinton voted for George Bush. Why? 
And I think it's, it's just a matter of personal connection. And I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot more to it than that. I, I'm not saying it should be that way. I think in a person, you know, in a perfect world, everybody should you know, really understand the issues and really vote for the issues that are in their best interests and society's best interests. But I don't think people really have the time to do that at all times and that they're, they're easily swayed on emotional issues that really don't impact them. Yes, sir. In campaigns of Bill Clinton, I was in middle school at the time, just getting in very interested in politics, and he really stressed the economy, I thought, more so than John Kerry. Uh -huh. Oh, it was a while ago. So, um, to what extent did you stress the economy? I talked a lot. There's pretty much the economy is all I talked about until the national press came in and said, you know, Iraq war vet comes back, calls president, chicken hawk son of a bitch, he's running for Congress. <laughs> you know, and then it just became the Iraq war vet runs against a Republican. And Which strategy do you think helped you more? Connect the voters uh, you're talking about. I, I think it's, I don't think there's any, there was any particular magic about it. I spent a lot of time in the rural counties of that district in forums not dissimilar to this, answering questions honestly and directly. And uh, I think that people may have disagreed with some of my positions, maybe, for example, abortion. And, uh, but they felt comfortable that what I said I believed and that they could disagree with me on some issues but still trust me to, to do what I say. And I think that's, I don't think John Kerry had that. And I mean, he may have that, but he allowed himself to be painted otherwise to his detriment. It seems kind of unclear in a lot of the you know, social type issues that one stand, they try to hit He's apologetic. the other. I mean, that's my take on John Kerry is he's, he's somewhat apologetic on some issues. And just, you know, people want to look at their leaders and they want to believe in their leaders. They want to have faith in their leaders. And they want to know where their leaders stand on issues. I mean, you're that way, I'm that way. I mean, we may over, you know, over process it and say, well, you know, I may not like his personality, but he stands for these core principles that I think are very important. But I'm not so sure everybody does that. I think it's just like relationships. You know, sometimes you get into a relationship with somebody who you just know isn't good for you, but you just love that person, <laughs> right? I mean, most of us have been there. And, and uh, here we are in that relationship with George Bush, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs>